and welcome to worship at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. It is so good to see all of you this morning. Uh, even though it might be cloudy outside, our hope is that you'll feel the warmth and the sunshine of those who have come into this place this day. I am David Melton, one of the pastors here, and it is my privilege to welcome you to worship those of you here in the room, but also those of you who are watching uh, as far as live streaming goes. So it is so good to have you with us, and we are so happy that you have this opportunity to share in your attendance. Uh, for those of you that can either use the back of the worship bulletin or the screen here for the QR code that is there that gives you uh, access to our attendance module, but also gives you information related to the life and the ministry of this church. And so we hope you'll take advantage of uh, that opportunity. We especially want to welcome those of you who might be here as first-time guests, and if you're in the room or online as a first-time guest, we invite you to reach out to us while you're here or as you have an opportunity that we might welcome you properly, but also to find out uh, what your needs are and how we as a church might be attentive to those. I want to remind those of you that are uh, parents of graduating seniors uh, that on May the 7th, we will celebrate our uh, senior day here. And so if you have a high school and or graduating college senior, uh, we would like to know that they, uh, who they are. And so if you would contact our church office, our youth ministry staff, and let them know uh, who you have and what you would like to have submitted as a part of that celebration. Yesterday, we had a wonderful day here in the life of the church as we celebrated once again by having a great day of service where we as a congregation come together and in one day try to provide uh, as many opportunities as we can for being in mission, both locally and internationally. If you are a part of our great day of service, if you are able, would you please stand <laughs> and let us just thank you for being a part of that beautiful day. We encourage you to uh, look at the other announcements that you have in the life of this church. You'll notice on the back of our children's Easter bash this afternoon, that is going to happen, rain or shine, and we will do it indoors if need be, otherwise we'll be outdoors. But we look forward to uh, having you here with us, and we will have a wonderful chance to celebrate with our children. Now let us stand, if you would, and join in these words of call to worship. We thirst for God's presence, so we come to the well to drink. We thirst for an acceptance and forgiveness, so we come to the well to drink. Lord, bring us to the water of peace and hope. Lord, meet us at the well of salvation. Amen. Our hymn is number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
come this day proclaiming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us join now together in this historic confession. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. If there are any children who are leaving to go to children's worship, you can go with the children's team standing right here by the door. And as they are leaving, I'll invite you to find the prayer concerns and celebrations that are listed on the back of the bulletin this morning. These are updated during the week on the church website. This morning, we extend our Christian sympathy to Emmy House and family on the death of her husband, Richie, on March 16th. Richie's the father of Trey and Jenny. And to Margaret and, John, to Margaret and Ron Gallagher on the death of her father, Henry Buck, on the 24th. He is the grandfather of Rachel and Josh. This morning we had a fall in the parking lot. I just want anybody that uh, witnessed that to know that she has been taken to the hospital and is um, undergoing testing. So please just keep Judy in your prayers. And now friends, let us go to God in a time of prayer, silent prayer, followed by the spoken prayer. Let us pray. Loving and living God, we come this morning in a spirit of thankfulness for your never-ending love and acceptance of each of us just as we are. Forgive us for our fearfulness as we rely more upon our own human illusions of control and satisfaction, even though we know that these illusions separate us from you. Forgive us for not trusting in your grace, in your abundance, in the promises that you have renewed with every generation. In Christ, may we learn to love you more than we love ourselves. Loving God, the news today is overwhelming. The tornadoes in Mississippi and across the South, the reports of tornadoes and hail in Georgia this morning, the flooding in California, the unrest in Syria, and the war in Ukraine are sometimes more than we can comprehend and certainly more than we can handle. We pray, O oh God, for all those who have been affected. May they know your peace, may they know your comfort, and may they know your healing embrace. O oh God, help each one of us to use this season of Lent to examine our attachments and to sense where you invite us to live more simply and more deeply. Shine the light of your love into the private corners of our lives where we, like the woman at the well, have acquired so much clutter that it has begun to restrict our freedom. Today, loving God, we pray for those among us who are hurting because they feel that they do not measure up to what the world has told them they should be. We lift those today who are in need of your healing touch as they wait for diagnoses, for surgery, for medical treatment. 
And we pray for those who are recovering from surgery or treatment. May they know your presence and your peace and your healing touch. We pray also for those who grieve the death of loved ones or friends. May they know your steadfast presence in their lives and know the peace of mind which only you can provide. For all anywhere who suffer, O God, from hunger or thirst or disease or mistreatment or any number of injustices, we pray. Guide those who can to reach out and to help them. And on this fifth Sunday of Lent, O God, we offer you our Lenten observance. We are on the road to Easter, walking the way that you have walked before us. We are ever grateful for the love and the ultimate sacrifice you made on our behalf. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Amen. Friends, there are several ways that we can respond to God's grace and goodness in our lives. And one of those is by giving of our financial gifts. And we can do that either by dropping something in the offering plate this morning or using the QR code that's on the screen or on the back of your bulletin. The other way that we can give back is by participating in worship. As you leave here today, I invite you to pick up one of these cards and take it home and give it to a friend. Give it to a neighbor. Give it to a coworker. This lists all of our worship services for Holy Week as well as for Easter morning. So take it and do someone a favor. Invite them to church with you. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, there is an Easter bash planned here for the children and those who are young at heart who'd like to attend. It's most likely been rained out outside, but it will still take place inside. So if you'll come at 3 o'clock today to the activities building for further directions, we hope you'll come and enjoy some time together, a fellowship. And now as the ushers come forward, I invite you to give back a very small portion of all that God has given to you.
Amen. You may be seated. Are we not blessed by some amazing youth and these incredible bell ringers? One of the things that is a gift of this church is that we show love by showing up. And yesterday, when we buried one of our members who was 59 years old, the choir showed up in mass and showed love. It sounds like I'm not working here. Is that right? All right. David, you need some help. Okay, I'm going to go back to the pulpit here and start over. <laughs> well, friends, it is a, it is a beauty to have a, a church where people show up for one another, and I'm so thankful for the choir who showed love to Emmy House and to her family by showing up. That was a beautiful thing, so I, I'm quite grateful for that. Is this me? Is that is that? That's still working. Okay, we'll try it again. And then secondly, I want to teach you a new number, 830. Do you know this number? Try it out loud. That's when I want you to come back on Easter. Okay? And I want you to come back at... 1115 on Easter Sunday. If you're a member of the church and you could possibly come at 830, that would be great. And some of you need to come at 830 next week because you want to have communion on the first Sunday. And if you want to have communion on the first Sunday, you'll come at what time? 830. I just wanted to prep you for that. And I'm very thankful for the shops at Dunwoody because they have opened their parking to us on Easter Sunday and we will not have the expense of a shuttle. So I'm so grateful for that. Let's thank them. That is a beautiful thing. <laughs> 202 years. Is that working? It's not. 202 years. That's a very long time, isn't it? 202 years from 1780, 1779 until 1981. It took 202 years for there to be the first, the first female Supreme Court Justice in the United States. And her name? Sandra Day O'Connor. You may remember her. Sandra Day O'Connor learned a lot about life growing up on a small 160,000 acre cattle ranch in Arizona. It was about a fifth the size of the state of Rhode Island. And she said it was mostly like living in our own country, except we had no heat and no running water. And how frustrating it was to have no heat and no running water. She said, according to her biographer, Evan Thomas, that she learned a lot about dealing with difficult people, especially difficult men who seemed to dominate the world at that time. She said that she learned how to deal with them from watching her mother. Her, hus her father was a harsh man, and he could be an even harsher man when he was drinking in the evening. And so she watched her mother and she learned from him, don't take the bait. Learn from her, learn from her mother, don't take the bait. No matter what happens to you in life, don't take the bait. And that served her well most of the time. But the story is told that she one time was having a confrontation with Tom Goodwin, who was the head of the Arizona State House Appropriations uh, committee, and she was having a struggle with him because he was someone who they said was drunk by 10 o'clock every morning. And because he was drunk by 10 o'clock every morning, she confronted him, and when she confronted him, he snarled at her, and when he snarled at her, he said this, he said, if you were a man, I'd punch you in the nose. To which she replied, if you were a man, you could. 
I think she may have taken the bait on that one. <laughs> she did everything she could to bring the court together. In fact, some of her fellow justices said that she was the glue that made us civil to one another. When she got on the court, only four of the six justices would ever share lunchtime meals together, and they were provided for them. So she made it a point to go and sit in other justices' offices to make sure that they would share in lunch because she felt like if people would break bread together, they could find ways to get along and to live civilly together even amongst their differences and she went to the other five justices and would sit in their offices waiting until they were willing to come and to have lunch with her and the other justices when she first got there she got some uh, some belittling some belittling words in other people's opinions. She had written an opinion, and one of the other justices, who shall remain nameless, wrote a, a belittling opinion about something she'd written. And her clerks took that and wrote back with some real zingers to get back at this other justice. But she said, that's not who we're going to be. That's not how we're going to do business here in the court. And she took them out of that draft opinion. She was able to do very well with most of the challenges in her life until she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, it really threw her for a loop. She had been able to deal with difficult people and difficult situations and difficult decisions, but for this, it really took her aback. And she decided not to have treatment, not to do anything about it, and she uh, was just going to see what happened with the disease. And that lasted for several days. And after several days of that downward spiral, she decided that she was going to take it head on. She was going to have the surgery. She was going to go back to exercising. She didn't miss a day in court. And after her surgery, she was out dancing 10 days later. And so she was able to take on that difficulty. She was the first. And we remember her today on her 93rd birthday she left the court, if you might remember, to take care of her husband who was dealing with dementia. She went to care for him and to care for him in the midst of his struggles. And after six months off the court, he didn't even know who she was. And now, back in 2018, she has also lost her memory. And so we remember her this day. We remember her this day and the pioneering work that she did for all the women who would follow in her footsteps and all the others who would follow in her footsteps in the years ahead. And so today we look to another first. We look to the first woman who has an extended conversation. It's really the longest conversation in all of scripture with Jesus. We look to find a woman at the well who our own Reverend Calissa Dodderman has beautifully illustrated this scripture passage. So I invite you to stand as you're able, not just to hear the passage, but to see the passage unfold before you. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sichar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of that water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. 
the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? This is the good news from the Gospel of John. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this story that echoes far beyond that day. This story of this first woman, the first woman to be in a long conversation with you and then to witness to her faith and her memory continues to resound with us today. Help us to remember for those who cannot remember this day. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. There was a woman who was enjoying an afternoon out in her yard, and while she was there out in the yard, a dog came up and started following her around her garden. And as she moved from one place to another, the dog continued to follow her. And then when she went into her house, the dog wanted to follow her into the house, and she thought the dog, it had a collar, it looked well fed, it didn't look like it needed a home, but she let the dog into the house, and the dog followed her all around the house. She sat down on the couch, and the dog dog sat down on the couch and fell asleep for an hour. She was kind of perplexed by this, but didn't think too much of it. She was an animal lover. So she, about an hour later, the dog got up, pawed at the door and got let out. Same thing happened the next day. The dog came and uh, came into her house, slept for an hour and then left. It happened for about two weeks. So she decided that she wanted to know what was going on so she wrote a little note and attached it to the dog's collar your dog comes to my house every day for a one hour nap what's the deal she got a note back the next day that said thank you for caring for our dog he lives in a house with four small children and needs the rest can I come with him tomorrow have you ever been tired like that? You ever been worn out and you just needed a break? I have not a person that gets very tired, as you know, but over the last seven weeks, I have been more tired since any time uh, than when we had our twins and they were little. The past seven weeks have been difficult for me. I'm not used to being slowed down like this. And sometimes by three o'clock in the afternoon, I am just tired. And I read the scripture text that Calissa uh, illustrated for you today. I've read it over and over again. And in reading it, I usually skip over this line. It never really caught my eye before, but I don't know if you noticed it. At the very beginning, it says, Jesus sat down by the well because he was tired. Even Jesus gets tired. And that was really reassuring for me, you know, that even Jesus gets tired. There are times when Jesus needed to take a break and he sat down there near the well. We don't know whether he was physically tired or emotionally tired, spiritually tired from carrying the weight of the world, <clears throat> knowing what was coming up in the days ahead. But it says that he was tired. 
and he sat there by the well and pretty soon a young woman comes by and she is carrying her burden. She is carrying a water jar and she goes to get some water from the well. And if you don't understand what's actually going on in this situation, you would not really get all the nuance of what's happening because if you page back through the Old Testament, you'll realize that the place that people went courting, the place that people went to find a spouse was at the well. People still do that. They go down to the local watering hole, right? You know, there's even that song about me that Elizabeth sings, think I'll go down to the well tonight, gonna drink till I get my fill. No? No? You know, the local watering hole. If you read back through the Old Testament, you will see in the Old Testament that Rebecca finds out about Isaac at the well. Rachel and Jacob get together at the well. Moses meets Zipporah at the well. And that was part of the courting ritual. An eligible man would sit there and he would wait for the right person to come along, swiping left and swiping right as he looked for the right person to come along. And when the right person would come along, he would say, would you give me a drink of water? And thus the courting ritual began. Will you give me a drink of water? And Jesus does this. He's sitting there and he asks for a drink of water. He doesn't even ask for it. He just tells her, give me a drink of water. It feels like a command. And she responds most appropriately. She responds by saying, who do you think you are? Just what do you think you're doing? You are crossing a boundary. You are violating a custom that you should not be crossing. You've already crossed into Samaritan territory and you're a Jew. You should have taken the long way around like everyone else. But Jesus does not seem to be confined to human made barriers, does he? When other people are moving from the Galilee down to Jerusalem, David, they would avoid Samaria. But Jesus goes straight through Samaria and sits down and brings breaks another social convention by asking this woman that he doesn't know for a drink. And she says, sir, who do you think you are? Who are you, a Jew, to ask for me a drink, a woman of Samaria? And then Jesus responds like he doesn't even hear her. And this is not a great pickup line, I don't think. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. Now, I think she's a bit intrigued by this. She doesn't know what to make of him, and she doesn't fully take the bait. She doesn't fully take the bait, and she responds to him, and it's just a great line. She's like, but sir, you don't even have a bucket. Your pickup lines pale in comparison. You don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. And then he says this to her, Jesus says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Everyone who drinks of this well will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And I don't know about you, but this is one of my favorite, favorite images of what it means to be a person of faith, of what it means to be a Christian. Are you the kind of person that there is a well of beautiful, clear spring water that just erupts out of you? Or do the things that come out of you look like they've been wrung from a dirty old mop? What kind of water is springing forth from you? Now, we all have our moments, don't we? When some brackish water comes out of us, when the things that come out of us are a little less than pure, they're not as beautiful and clean as we would like them to be. But Jesus gives that beautiful image saying that we are to be a people. If we drink from this well, we will never be thirsty. And what will come out of us is a beautiful spring of of living water. I came across this sign this week. Uh, It kind of hit me hard. It said, be the reason someone loves Jesus, not the reason they hate Christians. Ouch. 
That's pretty rough, isn't it? And if you are someone who calls yourself a Christian and there is brackish and dirty water coming out of you and not clean water that cleanses and refreshes, you might need to take a look at your life. You might need to take a little bit of inventory. And she responds and she says this. She says, sir, give me this water. Give me this water so that I may never be thirsty. And then she says, so I don't ever have to come back here to draw water again. Can you imagine having to carry your own water day after day, week after week, have to carry your own water and how difficult it might be. And for her to lug that jar of water day in and day out, just holding that water jug, it must have been quite a burden to carry. It reminds me of the Tony Campola story where there was a woman who was uh, washing the dishes after, after uh, she'd fed her family. And she said as she washed that dish that night, she thought, I have washed this dish over a thousand times. Anybody ever been there? You're like, I have washed this same stupid dish over a thousand times. I can't believe I have to wash it again. She washed it. She dried it. She put it up. She went upstairs and she packed her bags and left. She was tired. She'd had enough. She called her husband later that night and said, I'm leaving. I'm gone. I'm, I'm out of here. And he begged her to come back. He pleaded with her to come back home. And she said, no, I'm leaving. And she called the next day to check on him and the kids. And she called on him the next day. And she called to check in. And no matter how much he pleaded with her and the children pleaded, she was having nothing to do with coming home. This went on for weeks and then for several months. And so he hired a private investigator to try and find this woman that he loved. And the private investigator finally found her and she was working as a waitress in, two, in a town two states over, probably having to wash dishes there as well. And he went to find her. And when he drove through the night to find her, and when he finally got there, he pleaded with her to come home. And she almost immediately said, yes, I'll be glad to come home. And he was perplexed. He said, I've been begging you for months to come home. Why wouldn't you come home? And she said, I heard you say it, but I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure until you came to find me. And when you came to find me, that showed me that you cared. That showed me that you really wanted me to be there, and I'm thankful that you came to find me. I think the woman at the well must have been feeling similar things. She had done the same thing over and over and over, and her life was probably not working out the way that she had planned, and Jesus has come to find her and offered her living water, offered her a cleansing water, and then it's like the record skips. It's like we're having a conversation, and then we switch to a different conversation, because the next thing Jesus says to her is, go call your husband and come back. And she's like, wait, we were talking about water. Why are we talking about my husband? And he says, go and call your husband and come back. And the woman answered, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right. You have no husband for you've had five husbands. And the one you have is not your husband. What you've said is true. And often we start to make judgments about this woman based on this passage. I've heard it done by scholars and by sermons over the years, but that is not a reflection of what was going on in that day and time. There are two main reasons why she would have had five husbands, not because of some immorality on her part, not because of some infidelity on her part. She probably married a man and he died and she had to marry his brother. Now, how many of you would like to marry your husband's brothers? Any? No? That'd be worse? You know? Uh, so that was exactly what would have happened. She would have lost a spouse and had to remarry a brother or remarry someone else in the community. So she could have had five spouses because she had the pain of being a widow five times. Or she could have been divorced by a man for a variety of reasons, especially the, that they weren't able to have children together. And that may have been why 
she had five husbands. So this is through no choice of her own. But the beauty is that Jesus sees her. He really sees her and understands all that she's been through and all that she's going through. And he lets this beautiful living water flow out of him. He doesn't judge her. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't belittle her. He sees her. He sees deeply who she is. And then she sees him and she says, sir, I see that you are are a prophet but she doesn't want to get into her stuff too much she doesn't want to deal with her own vulnerability she doesn't want to deal with her own struggle and because of that she starts an argument one of our members said to me when you're on the spot start an argument that's what you should do when someone else has gotten you backed into a corner start an argument about something else and just try to take their mind off it and that's what she does. She tries to deflect from herself and she starts an argument about where we're supposed to worship. Do you worship on the mountain here in Mount Gerizim as the Samaritans do? Or should we worship in Jerusalem, which is proper? And she wants to start a theological argument. And rather than engaging in the theolog theological argument, Jesus elevates the conversation and said, there's a time coming when you won't worship God on the mountain and you won't worship God in Jerusalem, but you'll worship God in spirit and in truth. There's something more to our worship than worshiping God uh, in a certain place. And then you may not have seen it, but in the scripture, there's another small detail. It says she left her water jar there. She left her water jar there and she ran into town and she started saying to people, come and meet a man who told me everything that I'd ever done. And I imagine the people are leaning in going, can we hear everything you've ever done? I know you've had five husbands and the guy you're with now is not your husband. We want to hear this too. Why is it that we'd rather hear the dirt about people than celebrate their deliverance? You don't have to take that baby out for me. Bring him to me. Come here. Come here, hon. Yeah, we're going to be fine. Yeah, we're going to be fine. There we go. There we go. Is that okay? Yeah, we're going to be good. We're going to be good. You like this place? Yeah, you don't want to leave. We want kids to be here. We want them to feel comfortable. In fact, there was one little boy who uh, was really struggling and his mom looked at him and said, Frankie, are you okay? And she's, yeah, yeah, go ahead. She said, Frankie, are you okay? And Frankie said, I'm, I'm having a hard time, mom. I don't want to talk about it. And she said, well, you know, you're, I'm your mom. You can tell me. He said, I don't want to tell you about it because if I tell you, you'll yell at me and scold me. I'm going to go upstairs and tell God he'll forgive me and forget all about it. And that is the kind of God that we worship. The kind of God that we worship is a God who wants there to be clean spring water coming out of us. And if there is, if you're in a relationship that is causing you to have water that comes out of you that is not clear, you might need to change that relationship. If you're in a relationship where the water that is bubbling out of you is not clear, you might want to enter into forgiveness. Now, why do we forgive? We forgive because we've first been forgiven, amen? We forgive because we've been forgiven. That's the first thing. The other reason we forgive is resentment doesn't work, friends. Have you tried it? You know, obsessing about someone else's shortcomings, spending all your time and energy focusing on the dirt in their lives, resentment doesn't work. It might work for the short run, but it doesn't work for the long run. What it does is it ends up polluting us and it allows us not to have clear water to come out of us, but it allows brackish water to come out of us and we pollute our souls and we pollute those who we come in contact with. But how do we forgive is really more the question. The way that she was able to feel forgiveness in her life, this woman at the well, she had to have felt so much lighter. She had to have felt so much stronger because Jesus covered her with that cleansing water. We forgive by revealing the hurt. She had to hear, she had to face the hurt in her life and it had to be revealed. 
And then after the hurt is revealed, we need to release that other person from the hurt that we've been holding on to. And we release ourselves from that hurt as well. I've got a video to illustrate it just a little bit. Uh, we all have dirt in our lives, don't we? We all have dirt in our lives and we can spend a lot of time concentrating on that dirt and trying to dig out all the dirt and we spend all of our time and energy trying to get that dirt out and the dirt remains and sometimes muddies the water even more and we can't get the dirt out. The only thing that we can do is open ourselves to the living water in Jesus Christ and let that living water overflow us and crowd out all the dirt in our lives. Friends, let me invite you to be the first to forgive and not the last. Don't take the bait, my friends. Don't take the bait. Are you doing justice to the one who brings you living water? Are you doing justice to the one who brings you living water. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the gift of children, for the beauty of children who bring to us new life. Help us to be like them, whose souls are not polluted by so many things, and the brackish water doesn't come from them. Their tears are clear. May our tears be clear and may they be cleansing. May what bubbles up from us be something that brings hope and new life. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. I changed the closing hymn at the last minute. It is written by a man named Dick Blanchard who served the Grayson United Methodist Church, which is the last church that I served. Like the woman at the well I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from the well that never shall run dry. Will you stand as we sing together, fill my cup, Lord, and be willing to leave your burdens and your unforgiveness here. Because I'll have you know, unforgiveness is exhausting. Amen. I'd like to invite those who are joining the church to come forward. I'll ask you to have a seat for just a moment. We have some Easter eggs that you can collect this year. Uh, we have this wonderful tradition that started during the pandemic where we go out and egg other families in the community. Elizabeth and I went out to egg. Catherine, come on. Uh, Elizabeth and I went out to egg some families in the community. And when we went out to egg a family, we got a phone call. We had egged the people across the street. And so they ask us to come back. And we have people who are new members of our church. We had people who have, um, are visiting our church because their neighbors went and egged their yard and gave them a note about our Easter and Holy Week services. So you can sign up on the web to get your 10 eggs or 20 eggs or 30 eggs, depending on how many yards you want to egg. We'll give you preschool families to go egg their yards. We will give you uh, suggestions for people to go egg or just go egg your friends and neighbors in a kind way. 
I hope that you will do this and I hope that you will get the, the right yard. We're wel- glad to welcome Catherine Williams into our fellowship today. She grew up in the mountains of East Tennessee. You're our second East Tennessean to join today. We had about 12 people join at our early services. She has a degree in history from ETSU and a degree in historical preservation from MTSU. She's worked in the National Park Service for the last 30 years. Thank you for doing that on behalf of all of us. We are all blessed by our national parks. She moved to Atlanta two and a half years ago. She she enjoys playing the piano, taking care of her cats, and she works part-time at Belks. So let's welcome Catherine into the life of our church. We have two other members who are rejoining the church, Steve and Marty Fritz. Steve first became a member here in 1971, and he remembers his DUMC minister was Owen Kellum. Anybody back here that long? A few of y'all. Uh, He was in the scout troop here, number 266, where he achieved his Eagle Scout, uh, and he is a civil engineer with the FAA. Marty recently retired after 40 years as an occupational therapist. She volunteers conversing and teaching internationals who are learning to speak English. She enjoys spending time and being present and mentoring women going through all various stages of life. So, Catherine, you've been very patient with me. Will you continue to uphold this church and support it through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. We welcome you as the newest member of the Dunwoody United Methodist Church. You have been such a blessing to the park service. And we know that you will be a blessing to us. The pessimist says the cup is half empty. The optimist says the cup is half empty. The Christian says, fill my cup, Lord, no matter how full or empty it might be. And what God does is fills us with clear water. May we be known in this community as people with whom the clear spring water of God flows. Now go forth in God's grace as we sing, Lord, throughout these 40 days, preparing ourselves for Holy Week, Palm Sunday, and Easter.